So I'm going to read from uh, Genesis 45 and bits of 48 as well. One thing to keep in, in mind as we're reading, we're going to read about someone called Jacob, as you've heard, but halfway through it changes to Israel. Don't be confused, it's the same person. Pastor Dave has mentioned that before, obviously, back in chapter 35, the father changes or God changes Jacob's name to Israel. So we're talking about the same person, but this nice passage seems to swap the names over as we go. So this is from Genesis 45. It says, When they went up from Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they said, Joseph is still alive and he is ruler over all of the land of Egypt. Jacob was stunned, for he didn't believe them. But when they told him, uh, when they told Jacob all that Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to transport him, the spirit of their father was revived. Then Israel said, which is Jacob, Enough! My son Joseph is still alive. I will go to see him before I die. Sometime after this, Joseph was told, Your father is weaker. So he set out with his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. When Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. Then Joseph took them both. With his right hand, Ephraim towards Israel's left, and with his left hand, Manasseh towards Israel's right and brought them to Israel. But Israel stretched out his hand and put it onto the head of Ephraim, the younger, and crossing his hands, put his left hand on Manasseh's head, although Manasseh was the firstborn. When Joseph saw that his father had placed his right hand on Ephraim's head, he thought it was a mistake, and he took his father's hand and he moved it from Ephraim's head onto Manasseh's. Joseph said to his father, Not that way, my father. This is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He too will become a tribe and he too will be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he. Here, we are uh, wrapping up the book of Genesis today. It's been quite a journey, so I'll, uh, I'll pray quickly, but it's good to see so many faces back from, uh, from holidays, and a quick announcement that we didn't have in our previous announcements. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be doing a network preaching mini-series on the attributes of God called God Is. Four different attributes going to help us plan for the annual general meeting and plan for 2022 as a network. I think Pastor Craig from Holland Park will be here next week, uh, so you can be kind to him. And um, I think I'm at Corinda. But uh, so that's one announcement for us. And uh, I might just pray as we get into actually wrapping up the book of Genesis. Lord, there are many needs here, and there are many praise points. We've discussed many. Now we simply ask that you would be with us. Help us to know you better, to know your salvation plan, to know your grace, to know your holiness, to know you. In Jesus' support, Supreme and sublime name, we pray. Amen. Maybe you are like me. There are days I am tempted to be overwhelmed. Overwhelmed at a world groaning in decay and disease as cancer racks the bones of loved ones. Virus or old age stops the breath of family, of friends, even of beloved pets. Overwhelmed at a world groaning in sin. I mean, somehow it's become legally a right to kill a child in the womb for convenience sake. A child created in God's own image, and yet now illegal to counsel someone not to kill themselves or get help from others 
in doing so. And somehow our society has declared it right to take the Creator's name in vain, even deliberately to blaspheme Him with art, whether it's the motion picture kind of art, the award-winning movie, The Last Temptation of Christ, which portrays Jesus denying His resurrection and becoming a polygamist with Mary and Martha. Or the still picture kind of art, uh, also award-winning, the photograph immersion, a small memento cross with Christ hanging crucified, submerged in a glass of urine from the artist, the artist so called. Award-winning blasphemy, a culture of killing and disease, decay and death. We truly are experiencing a world losing its moral compass. Times described by the prophet Isaiah, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who consider darkness light and light darkness. So a big question that all Christians face is in God's once very good but now very fallen world. How do we flourish spiritually in a world overcome with evil? The book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, answers this question. It answers the question for the Israelites, reading Genesis 400 years after Joseph. As Israel was poised to enter the promised land, a land that God told Abraham back in Genesis 15, its inhabitants were not yet sufficiently evil for you to come and take it. But after the Exodus 400 years later, as Israel's reading the book of Genesis, the Canaanites are now sufficiently evil and cruel. And they have huge warriors, some like Goliath. And the Lord told Israel, you are to enter the land and cultivate it for my glory. See, the book of Genesis answers the question for the Israelites, and it answers the question for us. See, we groan with creation because of the effects of sin out there and in here. How do we flourish in a world overcome with evil? We trust our gracious God who overcomes evil with good. This, this is the crowning climactic lesson of the book of Genesis. From the beginning, a book all about God's relentless saving grace to a sinful human race. See, and near the end of the book, Joseph finally has eyes to see this lesson, a lesson which enables his glad forgiveness and his joyful zeal in serving God and his world, despite the evil choices and cursed circumstances we face. God allowing but overcoming evil with good. That is a surprising lesson to some, especially Joseph's brothers, and maybe you this morning. Since the brothers needed this lesson restated in Genesis 50, 17 years after it was first stated to them in Genesis 45, I reckon you and I could use a reminder too. So as we wrap up Genesis, our outline reveals various surprises. A surprising reunion of dad with Joseph, a surprising blessing, a surprising tribe line, and a surprising comfort. Or by the end, should it surprise us? See, near the end, Joseph had eyes to see this lesson. And at the end of Genesis, I pray that you too will have eyes to see how big God is and how great is His grace. 
like Lucy in the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, when first meeting the lion Aslan, who is a symbol of Jesus, the lion and the lamb. She finds Aslan extremely majestic, but not large. As the years go on, though, for Lucy, she once again returns to Narnia in a novel called Prince Caspian. And when reunited with Aslan years later, Lucy said, Aslan, you're bigger. He answered, that is because you are older, little one. Not because you are, Lucy said. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. That is my prayer for you as we wrap up Genesis, as you've gone through an epic and foundational Bible book, that you now find God bigger, not because He is, but because you've grown. You have clearer vision of His saving grace and overcoming evil with good in the world and in you and in me. So we look first at the surprising reunion of chapters 46 and 47. Now remember, chapter 45 had the big reveal. Uh, Joseph to his brother, speaking Hebrew for the first time, I am Joseph. And he expressly forgives his betraying brothers. Now it's time for Joseph's reunion with dad, Jacob. At the end of chapter 45, remember, Joseph sent his brothers back home to Canaan. And they say, Dad, Joseph is alive. Seriously. And he's in Egypt. And he says, there's five more years of famine, so let's pack up and go. Jacob packs up and sets out, but he pauses at Beersheba, verse 1. Israel, or Jacob, set out with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba, and he offered sacrifices to God. See, Beersheba is the southernmost populated town in the Promised Land. And, uh, just so you know, is like a fun uh, history fact, uh, Dan is the northernmost common spot uh, a phrase, uh, town in the promised land. So, a common Old Testament phrase from Dan to Beersheba is like a Queenslander saying, from Cape York to Coolangatta. Okay? As the southernmost town, Beersheba is the last stop on the way to Egypt. Now, it's a significant stop because in chapter 28, after Jacob departed Beersheba northbound for Haran, God appeared to Jacob in the famous Jacob's ladder dream, a ladder to heaven. And now Jacob is arriving at Beersheba, and he makes an altar, and he waits on God. The boys, the sons, said, come on with us, Dad, back to Egypt. But did God say that? See, earlier in Genesis 12, Grandpa Abraham journeyed by stages to the Negev. Now, that sounds odd, but Negev is simply the Hebrew word for south. <laughs> Since Beersheba is the southernmost town in the Promised Land, Abraham journeying by stages southward meant that he ended up at Beersheba. Verse 10 is significant. There was a famine in the land, so Abraham went down to Egypt. So we've been here before, but the only prom problem is that in Genesis 12, God did not tell Abraham to go to Egypt. In fact, God said, trust me to provide in the land that I'm giving you, Abraham. So for Genesis 12, which we called a chapter of one faith step forward and one step back, our outline was faith trusts in plan G, God's plan, doubt dabbles in plan me. 
And in going to Egypt, Abraham trusted in himself, not God. So here, grandson Jacob, he's showing signs that his faith is still maturing and growing. He waits on the Lord. See, to Jacob, God now seems bigger. And this schemer waits, and he prays and he worships. And in chapter 46, verses 2 and following, God kindly appears to Jacob again, confirming the words of his boys, go to Egypt. I will build you into a nation there and bring you back, not just your bones, but you, Jacob, Israel, as a nation. So going to Egypt now is not distrust as it was back with Abraham, pausing and worshipful waiting is a sign of trust and wisdom. See, a crucial reminder here, remember dreams and visions are not meant to be normative guidance for the Christian life. Remember, every dream in the book of Genesis relates specifically to protecting the line leading to Messiah advancing God's salvation plan, not my career plan or your marriage plans or family dinner plans. Also recall that the awe expressed by Pharaoh, that Daniel was a discerning and wise man because Daniel both interpreted Pharaoh's dream and had a wise famine plan. We'll see that Awe is captured in the law. Our primary source of guidance and wisdom is Scripture, is God's written Word. And I'm not going to read through these verses in full, but just notice the word pair describing God's law, known and followed, is the same. Wisdom and understanding, God's law, is always with us. So, the scriptural approach to guidance and wisdom is not only more reliable, but it is applicable and accessible to every person in every generation. And notice that scripture explains why it's okay for Jacob to go to Egypt now in famine. Why? Previous scripture, Genesis chapter 15. See, that came after Genesis 12, where Abraham doubted God. In Genesis 15, God later told Abraham, for 400 years your offspring will be pilgrims in a foreign land, but I will bring them back here when Canaanite evil has reached its full measure. And so, in chapter 46 of Genesis, God is repeating what He already told Abraham, what was already written in Genesis 15. Scripture clarified by previous Scripture. God is merely adding the detail of what that foreign land is. It's Egypt. So, now Egypt is God's plan, plan G not plan me. Go for it, Jacob. God is overcoming evil with good in this new kingdom phase to demonstrate forgiveness as key to His kingdom, then to multiply His people and to glorify God in the wonders of Exodus deliverance, and then return to Canaan as God's overcoming glory cultivators. So Jacob goes to Egypt, and he is reunited with Joseph, and verse 29 is precious in Genesis 46. He threw his arms around him and wept for a long time. Not only that, but in chapter 47, Jacob gets to meet Pharaoh, and Pharaoh gives Jacob's family, Israel, outstanding grazing land in the land of Goshen a place where shepherd-despising Egyptians never go. So in Goshen, Israel is together in Egypt, but not of 
Egypt, flourishing. That's chapter 46 and 47 in a nutshell, except for a surprisingly long list of names in chapter 46, all 70 Israelites, which just show that for a time and for a purpose, they pilgrimage in Egypt. From a surprising reunion and that surprisingly long list of names comes a surprising blessing. Now some years on, Jacob is ill and he's weak, so Joseph brings his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to grandpa. Look in your Bible at verses 10 and 11 of chapter 48. Feel Jacob's joyful reminiscence. Israel's eyesight was poor because of old age, uh, so he could barely see. So Joseph brought the boys and kissed him. Whoops, I've lost, uh, uh uh-oh, sorry, I've lost some pegs here. Forgive me, this is sort of stacked precariously. There we go. I'm back, back in action. So Joseph brought the boys to uh, Grandpa. Jacob kissed and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, but now God has even let me see your offspring. Wondering, is this my time to die? Jacob says to Joseph, bring them to me and I'll bless them. So what does Joseph do? Well, he presents his boys for grandpa's blessing, naturally putting Manasseh, the firstborn, at Israel's right hand, the hand of favor, of blessing, and Ephraim, the younger, at grandpa's left hand. So what does grandpa do? He crosses his arms deliberately and puts his right hand on the younger Ephraim. And Joseph protests, verse 18, not that way, my father. This one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. (laughs) And Jacob makes it very clear his aging eyesight is not the issue. Joseph's eyesight needs adjusting. His spiritual eyesight But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. Manasseh, too, will become a tribe. He, too, will be great. Nevertheless, the younger brother will be greater than he. See, God has brought Joseph a long way from his youthful days of boasting and taunting his brothers. But Joseph's kingdom vision still needs some corrective lenses. Why? Well, because God's kingdom is an unnatural kingdom, an upside-down kingdom. God's kingdom is supernatural, not following protocols of natural order. Seth is not the firstborn. Abraham's not the firstborn, Isaac's not Abraham's firstborn, Jacob's not, Joseph's not, Ephraim's not the firstborn. Throughout the entire book of Genesis, God's book of beginnings, God demonstrates from the beginning that God does not play by man's rules. God does not save by man's rules. The I'm, not, I'm, a, the I'm a good person rule, the I donate to charity rule, the I go to church regularly rule. <laughs> no. See, myself included, we all fail every good rule. From the golden rule to love God and love your neighbor as yourself rule, we all fall far short of the glory of God. But there is hope because God's upside-down kingdom is not just unnatural, it is undeserved. See, in God's kingdom, the last will be first, the least will be greatest. We lose our life to find it 
admitting that we are not righteous so that we can be declared righteous by grace. That is, by the undeserved gift of God. Undeserved grace is the very foundation of God's upside-down kingdom. It's, it's the legal tender, the currency of exchange. This unnatural, undeserved, upside-down kingdom now fast-tracks tra- fast us to the extremely surprising tribe line. <clears throat> See, Joseph, Joseph is the good son. Right? He's, he's the hero. He's our guy. I mean, certainly the, the promised line of Messiah will go through Joseph. I mean, which son of Joseph? Will it be Manasseh or, or Ephraim? Surprise of all surprises. God rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. Oh, so it's Manasseh the firstborn after all. No. He chose instead the tribe of Judah, whom he loved. Brother betraying, whore hiring, daughter-in-law defiling Judah? His is the chosen line, the line of Messiah. But, but, but Judah is not the firstborn. Judah is not even the child of beloved Rachel. Judah is not deserving. Correct, correct, correct. Judah might be the most undeserving son of Jacob. But this is God's upside-down kingdom. Surprise of surprises, wonder of wonders, grace heaped upon grace. God has a special redeeming love for all who repentantly trust in Him. Wait, God loves morally, horribly Judah? Now genuinely, repentantly Judah? Yes, indeed. Jacob knew what he was doing when he crossed his arms to bless the younger. And Jacob knew what he was doing on his actual deathbed when he calls all 12 of his sons to bless them and prophetically, deliberately, graciously said to Judah. Chapter 49, verses 8 and 10. You can look in your Bible or you can look on the screen. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the necks of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. Judah is a lion. My son, you return from the kill. He crouches. He lies down like a lion or a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter, that is the rule, will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until he whose right it is comes and the obedience of the peoples belongs to him. I thought Joseph's dream was that his brothers bowed to Joseph. Well, they did and they have. Joseph is still honored. He gets two tribes, one through Manasseh and one through Ephraim. But you see, the so-called Joseph narrative is not about Joseph. We must not read Genesis or any Old Testament book and reduce it to mere moralism. Be like this guy. Do like he did. Don't do like he didn't do. I mean, Joseph is a great example in many ways. Ethically, we have many things to learn from many Old Testament characters, Joseph included. But we're not to read the Old Testament merely moralistically. We must read it redemptively. 
That is, as God's big salvation story unfolding by His relentless saving grace. See, ultimately, the Joseph narrative is not about Joseph, and it's not about Judah. It's about him, Jesus, he whose right it is, the obedience of the nations belong to him. Jesus is the one who grabs the neck of the ultimate enemy, the serpent, And that's why I've titled today's message, The Sovereign Serpent Slain Savior. See, in Genesis 3.15, after the serpent tempted Adam and Eve into sin, God said to the serpent, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. You, serpent, will strike his heel, but he will strike your head. See, Genesis 3.15 is the acorn out of which the oak tree of God's salvation story grows and spreads globally, growing against spiritual conflict. See, immediately after this, promise of the offspring of the woman crushing the offspring of the serpent's head. We see immediately spiritual conflict between two divergent seed lines, the the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of salvation. The family line forsaking God and the family line following God, Cain and, and Abel who's murdered, then it's Cain against Seth. Ham against Shem, Ishmael against Isaac, Esau against Jacob, and us against God. Every sinful mess in Genesis is pressing towards the hope and resolution of Judah's selfless substitute in Genesis 44 and Joseph's fatherly forgiveness in Genesis 45, bringing family reconciliation. And then in chapters 46 to 50, there is a repeat of the promise of a future together, together in peace with God in the promised land. (laughs) And it's not just Canaan that's being foreshadowed. It's the new heavens and the new earth. You see, the entire Bible is foreshadowed in Genesis. The gospel of Jesus is foreshadowed in the book of Genesis, especially at this end. You know, to make it supremely clear how undeserving this tribe line is, At the start of Matthew's gospel in the New Testament, there are many more, morably, horribly, but genuinely, repentantly, people in the lineage, the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew 1 begins, and it has Judah's daughter-in-law, Tamar, who pretended to be a prostitute so she could get pregnant. And then there's Rahab next in the genealogy who actually was a prostitute and a pagan one at that. But they turned to the living God, genuinely, repentantly. And He made peace and He saved them. How? Well, that leads to our final point, which shouldn't be surprising because chapter 50 repeats what chapter 45 said, that God overcomes evil with good. How? We shouldn't need, we shouldn't be surprised, but we often need reassurance, and and Joseph's brothers do. Jacob dies at the end of chapter 49, and Genesis chapter 50 
It's a full 17 years after Genesis 45, the family reunion where Joseph forgives his brothers. But now dad's dead and the brothers panic. What if Joseph was kind and forgiving only because of dad? After Jacob blessed Judah with the scepter, with the messianic line, Will Joseph's spiritual vision is now in perfect focus. His hindsight, Joseph's hindsight is 2020. Look in your Bibles at Genesis 50, verses 19 through 21. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, do not be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And Joseph comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You see, throughout Genesis, God has overcome evil with good, with grace. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Judah, stumbling, <laughs> pursuing plan me. But God was still at work. You planned evil, but God planned good. See, Joseph's hindsight is 2020. And Genesis foresight is 2020, pointing to Jesus. See, the Bible's answer to evil is that God has done something about it. A greater deliverance than saving a generation from a famine is saving a world from sin. Mary will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus because he will save people from their sins. The name Jesus means God saves. See, just as the brothers planned evil against Joseph and God planned good, we planned evil against Jesus, but God planned good. Acts 2. This Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross. Undeserved grace is the foundation of God's upside-down kingdom, the currency of exchange, the great exchange. His righteousness, my wretchedness. He takes my sin and He gives me His righteousness. You see, God does not just overcome evil with good. God experiences evil for our good. He owns our condemnation for our justification. You see, grace by the undeserved gift of God is trusting in Jesus, His gift. You know, Christian historian John Dixon wrote a really helpful little book called, If I Were God, I'd End All the Pain." And he begins his book talking about his father dying in a plane crash when John was eight years old. And the struggle, why God? Why is the world like this? And he writes, it's a very short book. I encourage you to read it if you struggle with evil in the world and God allowing it. But John helps us with clarity that God overcomes it by experiencing it. See, he says that we like to memorize Psalm 23, 
right? The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. But we tend to ignore Psalm 22, psalms of lament that say, God, why have you forsaken me? See, the times when it feels like the good shepherd is gone walkabout, we must remember the good shepherd has laid down his life for his sheep. The New Testament Gospels are clear that on the cross, Jesus Christ cried out Psalm 22 in fulfillment. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that is why we sing, He's forsaken so that we can be forgiven. God has overcome evil with good and powerfully so. But Jesus dying in our place is not the end of the story. You see, God himself has a surprise up his sleeve. The serpent and the forces of evil thought they would beat Jesus by killing him, by striking his heel. But weep no more, for the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy, and he lives. Acts chapter 2 adds the verse, But God raised him, ending the pains of death, because it was impossible for Jesus to be held by death. He is the sinless King of Kings. You know, similar to the fictional Chronicles of Narnia, a different author of fiction put it like this. Do you know why Satan is so, this is a dialogue with someone, do you know why Satan is so frustrated all the time? Because wherever he works a particularly clever bit of mischief, God uses that to serve his own righteous purposes. God gives us freedom to do evil if we choose, but God uses his own freedom to create good out of that evil for that is what He chooses. So in the long run, God always wins. But in the short run, it can feel uncomfortable. And that's why the Heidelberg Catechism, question 28, asks this. How does the knowledge of God's providence help us? That is, that God is guiding and orchestrating human history. Whatever we mean for evil, God overcomes with good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, as we've memorized in Romans 8, I'm sure you have. But this is what Heidelberg how a Heidelberg Catechism answers the question. We can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing will separate us from His love. All creatures are so completely in His hand that without Him we can neither move nor be moved. You see, we trust in the God who is overcoming evil with good through Jesus. See, in the Bible's answer to evil, God has done something and God will do something. He is risen and He comes again. So hope considers our life's location in the whole of God's story. A story written by one who did not spare his own son. See, hope reaches past our groaning for the end of the story. No more sin, no more suffering, no more separation. God's majestic bigness and His relentless grace are seen most clearly in the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. But you must choose. I started with Narnia and I'll end with Narnia. Earlier, in The Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe, before they meet Narnia, they're told that, uh, before they meet Aslan, they're told 
he's a lion. And they're, oh, Lucy asks the question. I'm rather nervous about meeting a lion. Is, uh, is, he, is he quite safe? And Mr. Beaver, who's guiding them, says, safe? Who said anything about safe? He isn't safe, but he is good. See, he's good in his son. And when we are in Christ, we have peace with God. He is not safe to those who do not repentantly trust in Jesus, but he is for those who fall on our knee in the great exchange and give him our wretchedness and receive his righteousness to follow him and worship him. I hope that you today, and I hope your view of God is so much bigger and that you see his goodness more than ever today. Let's pray. Oh, God in heaven, how good you are that you so love the world that you sent your only Son, that all who believe in Him will not perish, but have eternal life in your presence, a new heaven and a new earth, the ultimate promised land. Lord, may we now live in that hope as in the book of Revelation, the, the other end of the Bible where it says of your people that we conquer the dragon by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, not loving our lives, even to the point of death. Oh, may we trust you. Use us, Lord, to overcome evil with good as we speak the good news and live it before the world. In your name we pray, amen.